I was born July 21st, 1949 in Iowa City, Iowa. Okay, my name Janice. I was named after my mother's favorite paper doll. My middle name Lee, I don't think has any significance. Maybe she just liked the way it sounded with Janice. I have some really vivid memories of when I was turning three, so that's pretty early. We were visiting my grandparents in San Francisco, and I can remember playing in the sand in their backyard with dress boxes because my grandmother didn't have a bucket or anything for me to play with. So she gave me dress boxes and a wooden spoon. And I also remember that same trip being scolded and going in to a bedroom where my aunt was putting her hair up in pin curls. And when I saw her, I immediately sucked in all my cries and went back out in the living room because I didn't want anybody to see me cry. And to this day, I don't cry very easily. Uh, my mother was born in 1919 in Indianapolis, Indiana. My dad was born in 1921 in Fairfield, Iowa, and they met in Fairfield, Iowa. My mother was a widow with two children, my sisters, Barbara and Sherry. Barbara uh, was just a year old and Sherry was four or three and a half. Uh, my parents uh, were definitely part of my life, but I don't, I, I just remember my kid memories being a kid with friends and sisters more than I remember being with my parents, except that my mother always cooked a good dinner every night. Um, the only thing I can remember doing for fun with my father was sitting on the couch and watching boxing on our little tiny black and white TV. <laughs> uh, my dad was more strict, but neither one of them were particularly strict. Um, they were, uh, we, we just, we had a ton of independence and freedom, and so um, we weren't told what to do very often, uh, except my dad liked us to be quiet while he was watching TV, <laughs> which was mainly baseball and boxing. Uh, my dad, uh, worked for the government as a civil servant. He worked for the Veterans Administration, the Air Force, and also at times um, the Federal Aviation Agency. And we were uh, probably on the lower end of middle class. And um, I don't think we didn't have any extra money at all, but I never felt like we were poor. We had food on the table and a roof over our heads, and everyone around us seemed to be in about the same boat. Uh, their marriage was kind of rocky. My dad was um, kind of abusive verbally, never physically, but kind of abusive verbally to my mother. Um, but she had a lot of confidence, and she kind of let it roll off her back. Um, so. It wasn't the best, and it, it was a really good, bad example, and one that I didn't want to follow. Uh, we only spent money on the bare necessities. We didn't have money for extras. We didn't go on vacations or anything. The only time we traveled was approximately once a year. From the time I was six years old, we moved every year. And that was like a vacation, because we went by car, and we stopped and ate at restaurants and stayed in hotels, and I thought it was great. Um, other than that, we did not go out to eat ever. I don't even remember going to a hamburger joint. Um, pizza does, wasn't around there. Mexican food was non-existent then. So we just, um, we just bought the, the bare necessities. Okay, Sherry, um, Sherry is seven and a half years older than me. Uh, she was definitely the big sister. Barbara is five years older than me, and um, they were really good sisters. Sherry liked to um, make doll clothes for my dolls. She liked to teach me tumbling tricks, uh, back bands, and all sorts of things. Um, she both of my sisters gave me a lot of confidence. Uh, when I was getting ready to go to kindergarten, they wanted me to be the smartest kid in kindergarten, so 
They taught me before I went, and they made sure that I knew how to tie my shoes before I went to kindergarten. And they really thought that I was the cat's meow. So um, my parents were kind of hands off, but my sisters were a huge influence in my life. Later, Sherry went to live with um, our aunt and uncle, Marge and Jack, and Barbara and I became very close. And even though she was five years older, she played games and um, played with toys at my age level. And even though at times we fought, most of the time we got along great and she had an in a huge influence on my life. My father's parents, Mama Bell and Papa Dude lived in Fairfield, Iowa. I saw them once or twice a year until I was six and we moved away from Iowa and I never saw them again. That's a really big regret in my life uh, that I never came to know them. And I was their only grandchild, although they treated Barbara and Sherry as if they were their grandchildren as well. But um, my grandmother was a really huggy person and I was kind of standoffish and I, I just regret that I never got to know her and and feel of her love because I know she probably, now that I'm a grandmother, I know how she, she must have felt about me and she never really got to spend much time with me. So I do feel bad about that. Nana and Hai were incredible grandparents. We only saw them about twice a year. Um, they lived in exotic places like San Francisco and Seattle. And um, when we went to visit, they would take us to nice restaurants and any of the sites and exciting things that were around where they lived. So, and um, Nana was one of those amazing people that everyone wants to be around. She was the life of the party. She was fun. She was funny. Um, she loved us without being ooey gooey about it. Um, I just adored her, and I and I loved High. High played games with us. He taught me how to play canasta and gin rummy, which I play to this day with Alf occasionally. And um, if I ever wanted anything, wanted anything, if I was around him, all I had to do was hint, and it would be mine. So they spoiled us a little bit, and um, they were just extremely fun to visit and had my grandmother had a big influence on me even though I only saw them rarely. Uh, every time we moved, somehow we managed to adopt a stray kitten or cat. And um, my dad never wanted us to, so sometimes we were able to hide the fact from him. And then when we would move, we would leave the cat behind, which is fine because cats are good at adopting other families. So. Um, we had that. I did not have a dog until I was 14. My parents moved to Palmdale, California, and I spent the summer with my aunt in Denver. And when I arrived in Palmdale to start school, there was a little um, miniature gray poodle named Charlie. And that was my first and only dog. And it was, it was a good time of life to have him because by then my sister was out of the house and I was basically an only child, so that was really fun. Uh, I have always been like I am right now. I was happy, optimistic, confident, um, down to earth. Uh, I, I had fun, I laughed, I played with friends. I was I think I was just the soul that I am today. You just have that personality within you, and I, I was who I am now. So whatever anyone would say about me now, practical, down to earth, um, positive, that's what I was then. I loved everything my mother made, really, um, except maybe peas. Uh, but my favorite meals, I think, were spaghetti and chili and um, pot roast. And uh, I loved ice cream and soda pop, which we got very little of. So when my mother would buy a six pack of bottled orange knee high, each one of us girls got two and I would drink mine really quickly and Sherry would drink hers really quickly and Barbara didn't care about it. So she just kept it around to make Sherry and I miserable. <laughs> and We wanted to get it out of the fridge and drink it. Um, to this day, I love soda pop and ice cream because I think because it was rationed and now I can have as much as I want and 
I have as much as my diet will allow. Uh, it was just a, such a different time we played outside. We went outside and played, and I can even remember being in, my, in Iowa City, which we moved from when I was six, and I played outside by myself or with friends, just coming in to get something to eat for lunch maybe, and, and then dinner, but we were outside the whole time, and there was a creek behind my house, and you would think that would be a real concern for my parents, but I don't re really ever remember being warned about it. We played by the creek all the time. Sometimes we saw snakes, um, but our parents were not worried about any person preying on us. We were free to roam about the neighborhood barefoot in the summer and just having fun as a child. So that's what I did, and it, it was really, I wish that it was more like that for my kids and especially my grandkids. Uh, I, I actually cared about clothes as a kid, I think. Um, and my grandparents, because I had a birthday in the summer and then Christmas was in the winter, I would get outfits, an outfit for my birthday and for Christmas from Nana and Hi and also from my sister's grandparents, the Mazes. And so I always had two nice summer things and two nice winter things every year. And um, other than that, you know, it was the bare necessities. And then when Sherry got old enough to sew, she started sewing clothes for herself. And sometimes I got hand-me-downs and um, everything was really well made and very nice. I had Pendleton wool skirts and, and um, really nice things. So I, I always felt that I was dressed okay, even though we didn't have any money. No allowance. Heavens no. I did not have any money until I was old enough to work. I started a job. I was either 15 or 16 when I had my first job, and I had no money of my own until then. <laughs> I hardly had any responsibility. Um, my parents, like I said, were really hands off, and instead of making us clean our rooms, they just shut the door. And uh, I do remember maybe dusting and vacuuming on Saturday for my mom, but, and, and I did dishes. And I learned to fix some basic foods for myself and started making cakes when I was about 10 and learned how to make the frosting that my family loves to this day. And uh, that's when we got a hand mixer, an electric hand mixer when I was 10. And that's when the cake making started. I was a really good student and because my parents were um, so hands off, I gained uh, a lot of needed attention by being a good student. So school was a place that I excelled and I wanted the attention from my teacher. And um, so I was always a really good student. And because of that, when we moved every year, my mother always used to say, water raises to its own level. And so Whenever we moved, because I was a good student, I was attracted to good students and they were attracted to me. So I was always friends with, with really good kids who cared about school. So, and that lasted through grade school, high school, college, and even in my 40s, graduate school. Um, school is a, a good, safe place for me where I feel confident. So it was really important to me. And I was kind of the teacher's pet type kid. <laughs> uh, once I got old enough, I guess it would be uh, math, art, and English maybe. I never liked history or social studies. Um, I like that kind of thing a lot more now. Um, and then once I got into, I, I took French when I was in eighth grade in Billings, Montana, and then we moved, and I never took it again, but all through high school, I knew that when I got to college, I wanted to major in French, and I did. Yes, which is amazing, because I moved every year, so I don't remember anybody's name except for Mr. Petrie, who was my math teacher in seventh grade in Denver, Colorado. And I don't remember why I, I liked him so much, just that he was really good, and, um, and I felt like, 
I mean, I was, it must have been some kind of an algebra or pre-algebra, and I remember loving it, and I loved him, and I, I think I even wrote him a letter after I moved, so I really liked him. Uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't think I did, to tell you the truth. I, I don't remember. I wasn't a kid who put posters up in my room or any kind, anything like that, so... I don't remember having a role model, unless it was my grandmother. I thought she was the best thing in the whole world. Uh, I spent my summers playing with friends. Uh, we, I didn't take any lessons. We didn't go anywhere, although if we moved, it was usually in the summer. So that was kind of an exciting thing. But I would always uh, have a best friend or two in the neighborhood. And I just, I just remember playing all summer. Um, we had television by then. I don't remember watching it in the summer. Uh, we were outside playing all summer. In the winter, I was inside playing. So um, we just played in the summer. I only went on one family vacation with my immediate family, and that was when we lived in the South. We went to South Carolina. Other than that, our, like I said, our family vacations were moving from one place to another. However, this is a really big thing in my life that I tell people and even I can't believe it. When we lived in, I don't remember, I think we lived in Mobile, Alabama. My sister was 13 and I was, no, we must have lived in Georgia. My sister was 13 and I was eight going on nine maybe and she was 13 going on 14. And my grandparents lived in Seattle, Washington which is, of course, diagonally across the United States. And my parents put the two of us on a train, and we traveled to my grandparents' house to visit them. And um, we were all by ourselves. And when we got to Chicago, we had to change train stations. And the porters there put us on a cab, and we went to another station and got on our train. And I guess the porters were taking care of us along the way. And I was so young, I didn't realize it. I just remember kneeling in front of my seat on the train and coloring for three straight days. And I also remember going to the, uh, why can't I remember, dome cars at night and leaning back in a chair and looking up at the stars through the glass of the dome cars. So that was, and then we came back home. So that was a pretty amazing vacation to visit my grandparents, but it was just Barbara and I who went. Um, I don't remember doing too much other than Christmas. We had the typical traditional Christmas tree and presents under the tree. Um, we celebrated May Day by making um, little baskets out of construction paper, and then we'd go around and get flowers out of people's yards, but not not things that they would not want us to pick, but like um, maybe a sprig of um, lilacs or some pansies or something. And we would put those in our little homemade cone baskets out of construction paper, and we would put them on the door handles of people, and then we'd ring the doorbell and run away. And that was a tradition in the Midwest, I guess, because I don't remember doing it after that. I remember doing that for May Day and Christmas, and we had Thanksgiving, but we were always home together. It was just another family dinner, so I don't really have any memories. Occasionally, we went someplace for Christmas. I had an aunt in Memphis, Tennessee. I can remember going there at least once, maybe twice. Um, so Christmas was, you know, just like it is today, a big deal. Um, but the other other holidays, no. I loved all the holidays at school, though, and all the holiday art. Valentine's Day and Halloween, I, I loved all the art projects. Um, I got a baby doll when I was five or six in Iowa City, and um, Sherry was 12 or 13 and made doll clothes for it. And uh, that, that's the one gift I really remember and loved. We also had an electric train. I don't know when that came into our lives, and at some point it was sold, but that was really a, an amazing thing, too. I wish I had it today. It was phenomenal. Um, I think I probably always wanted to be a teacher. 
as soon as I started thinking about what I want to be, I think I always wanted to be a teacher. I loved school. And the day after school was out in the summer, I played school. And my friends played school. And uh, it, that was, I always wanted to be a teacher. And um, then eventually I majored in French and was going to be a French teacher. And when it came time for me at the age of 40 to maybe go do that, I realized I didn't want to be a French teacher and teach kids in middle school who did not want to be there. So, um, and I also, I didn't have a teaching degree, so, uh, and I didn't want to get one. So that's when I decided to become a speech language pathologist. And I, because I was in the school, I feel like I was a teacher. I remember not being involved in world events whatsoever. I don't remember ever being interested in the news or who was the president or anything. But um, I do remember, ha you know, they have fire drills nowadays and earthquake drills here in Utah. We had bomb drills because we were worried about Russia dropping the nuclear bomb on us. And I can remember at some, I'm not sure where I lived, I remember having a drill where we had to go outside and go into a bunker that was there specifically for the kids, I guess, at the school. Um, but I don't really remember being scared about it. It wasn't a real fear of mine. Um, uh, so that's, that's probably about it. Oh, color TV was a big deal. I was pretty old by the time, we, I was probably in high school by the time we got a color TV. Um, my sister gave me a typewriter, not that it was a new invention, but that was a really big deal. I got that from her when I was in high school. She was in college, and I don't know where she got the money to buy it, but she bought me a typewriter so that I'd have it for high school and college. Um, as far as inventions, I don't, I don't remember inventions, but I'll tell you what I, what I am most happy about is that I was a teenager in the 60s, when and 50s 50s and 60s when rock and roll elvis presley the beatles and all the fabulous rock and roll i just feel very fortunate to be part of that generation that grew up with the music that still influences the music of my grandchildren and they still love my old music and that's really fun because i hated my mother's music let alone my grandmother's music but my grandkids like our music and i that was the best so I don't remember an invention so much as, boy, was I lucky to live in the 50s and 60s with the music. <laughs> um, I just think that children were so innocent then because there weren't any outside influences. TV was just coming in and really everything on TV was sweet and, you know, there was nothing objectionable about it for a child. Um, and so I just feel like being f not forced, but really wanting to go outside and play and learn how to ride a bike and ride your bike all summer and build a, a fort and make a snow cave and have a snowball fight and do all those things that we did because there was nothing holding us. There were no screens in our house that held us inside. So just being able to play and having the freedom to play and having the innocence of childhood for as long as possible because I really felt like I had that and I know that my grandchildren don't have it and didn't have it even when they were little. So, and I know their parents try to protect them from all of that. My parents didn't even think about worrying about anything from the world um, contaminating us. So um, we were just free to do whatever we wanted and we did wholesome good things because that's all there was. I went to three different high schools. Um, my first high school, I was in ninth grade in Palmdale, California. And um, I met a girl and we went to the very first football game, which was probably that first week of school. And afterwards there was a stomp and for the rest of my high school years, and I've talked to you about this before, we went to, I went to every basketball and football game in all three high schools and went to the dances afterwards. And the most important thing about that very first football game I went to in ninth grade is that 
here I was with this brand new friend. I had just met her because it was probably the first week of school. And behind us were sitting two boys that were interested in us and started up a conversation. And one of them belonged to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And that was the moment that, um, uh, that was a, a a place that I was supposed to be and they were supposed to be so that eventually the missionaries could teach me and I would become a member of the church. And um, that those days in Palmdale, I was there about a year and a half and joining the church and having a group of about nine girls and nine boys who were good friends was really wonderful. They were all really good kids. Only one was LDS and then another one became LDS and myself. And we had an absolutely wonderful time going to the movies, um, having little parties together where somebody's mother would host us and make us something good to eat. And we'd just sit around and enjoy each other and dance and listen to rock and roll. And um, anyway, that was, uh, that that was my that was my teenage years um, games dances movies eventually i was in a drill team in elko nevada and that was a lot of fun so i was always really involved in high school and of course wanting to get good grades and everything but i had i had good friends i won't say i never did anything wrong but i don't remember getting caught <laughs> I don't remember being in trouble very often. Um, the only time my father got mad at me and gave me a little swat was when I was about seven and it was for sassing my mother. And other than that, I, as a teenager, I did have a curfew and I honored it. Um, I think I had to be home by midnight on um, Friday or Saturday. So, But I dated quite a bit and just mostly our dates were movies and maybe a 25 cent hamburger. <laughs> uh, Daddy-o, cool. Of course, that's still popular now. Um, if I had time to think about that, I probably could. I can't think of anything specific right now other than those. It was kind of the, the beatniks, which I was not a beatnik, but the beatniks kind of came up with the Daddy-o stuff. Um, everybody was very modest in those days as far as what we wore to school. I didn't start wearing pants until high school before that. Everybody wore dresses. It must have been required. I don't even remember. We just always wore dresses. And then um, eventually in Elko, maybe it was, started wearing bell bottoms and um, mini skirts came into popularity then and I did wear mini skirts. Um, but, uh, my sisters had really good taste and like I said, Sherry was a really good seamstress and so I had, I mean, just kind of the typical plaid wool skirts with sweaters in the winter and, um, and then when I was in high school I started sewing for myself so I, I felt okay about what I wore. I learned to drive from a boyfriend in Elko. He had a Jeep, it was a manual transmission, and that was good. I learned on a manual transmission. I did not get a driver's license until I was able to buy a car. It was a $600 Peugeot, and it had an electric start, so you pushed a button to start it, kind of like you do nowadays. And um, that's when I started driving. And uh, I didn't know anything about cars and there was a red light on it. And I knew that I had no money to fix the car, so I ignored it. And it was out of oil and burned up the engine. And that was the end of that car. <laughs> what was your graduation from high school like? Oh, I moved to Ogden, Utah when I was in high school. And I just did not feel like I had any close friends all through my senior year. So it, a high, high school graduation was not particularly fun for me. I did go where other kids were having a party at Ogden Canyon, stayed up most of the night just because you're supposed to, but I didn't enjoy it. 
Um, I was just anxious to get that over with and move on to college. <laughs> okay, I was born in Iowa City, Iowa. Then we moved to Topeka, Kansas. Then Leavenworth, Kansas. Then back to Topeka in a different neighborhood. Then to um, Warner Robins, Georgia, which is an Air Force town near Macon. Then to Mobile, Alabama. Then Denver, Colorado. Billings, Montana, which was my least favorite move in my whole life. It was hard to make friends there. And then um, Palmdale, California was wonderful. Then Elko, Nevada was, I had a lot of friends there. Then Ogden, Utah was tough because I was a senior and it was, uh, it seemed like the kids there had been together since kindergarten. And so it was very hard to make friends there. And then um, my parents stayed in Ogden. I was anxious to get away from home. And so I went and lived with my sister Barbara and her husband Lyle in Boise and went to Boise State University for one semester. But by then I had met a boyfriend and so I came back to Utah and went to Weber State College and um, later met Alf and um, so that was, that was the end of my moves until I got married. I loved college. I loved feeling more adult. Um, I, I had a boyfriend. Um, I dated. Uh, we, we did lots of fun things. Um, I loved French. I had to start at the beginning because I hadn't done it in high school, so I loved studying French. We had a small group that were majoring in French, some of them returned missionaries, and I loved being in that group. Um, and I loved, I, I just really liked being at Weber State. I had, I joined, a, they weren't um, national sororities, but it was a club called La Dianita, and I met lots of friends there. So I just had a great time in college. I loved it. Okay, um, in Elko, Nevada, I worked in a hotel changing beds and cleaning rooms with a lot of Native American women who spoke in their native language to each other. And I only lasted two weeks because it was a very lonely job. Um, then after that, I worked for the ANW root beer stand as a car hop. We did not wear roller skates, but that was fun. And um, then uh, I did not work again until I think the summer between high school and college. I worked at um, on a assembly line putting together meals for, we were at war in Vietnam, and so I was doing that. And, um, and then finally in college, I worked for the IRS, which was a place where a lot of college kids going to Weber worked at the IRS, and we had really good hours. We could work from four to eight, or eight to midnight, or sometimes eight to two, or four to 2 a.m. and then we would get up and go to class the next morning. But during the busy season, during the tax season, oftentimes we worked after midnight. So that was, and, and it was a good paying job at the time. I think it was about $2.98 an hour, <laughs> which was good. Um, and that's how I was able to finally buy a $600 car. <laughs> Oh, because of our cruise, my family knows this story already, but I will talk about it. Um, I met Bruce Hunter in June after I graduated from high school. I was still 17. He was a return missionary, and um, that was really exotic to me to be dating someone four years older, and he was, he was a very nice guy. And um, then I went to Boise State and missed him, came back to Weber, and he and I dated for about a year and a half. And then um, because he had never dated anyone else, he wanted 
to take a break. And at the time we were practically engaged and so it was very hurtful to me. So we broke up and he dated for about six weeks and that was all he needed and he was done. But in the meantime, he felt sorry for me and we all worked at IRS. So he had this guy in his unit where he worked named Alf Kofid. And he asked Alf if he would take me out because he felt bad for me because everyone still thought I was with him. Here he was out dating and I wasn't dating anybody. So he asked Alf to take me out. He doesn't remember it that way, but that's, that's what Alf says. So um, I met Alf and, um, and we started dating and I dated both of them for quite a while. And with Bruce, I had really nice, interesting, long talks. And with Alf, we went out and did things and laughed our heads off. And, um, but for the next year and a half, I dated both of them. Eventually, Bruce went away to medical school. And in the spring of his first year of medical school, Alf asked me to marry him. And I said yes. And I broke up with Bruce on the telephone and never wrote, talked on the phone, heard from him again until 48 years later when we saw each other on a cruise with my entire family there who already knew all about this story. So that was quite an experience, but um, he, he was a very nice guy and, and I realized that when I saw him again on the cruise, he was a nice guy. Um, but I had uh, a better life than I could possibly have had um, with him because I married Alf. It, it has been a fun, um, dynamic, interesting life. And we have the most incredible four children that wouldn't be here if I was with Bruce. So <laughs> I'm really glad that I made the choice I did. And once I made the choice to marry him, I never looked back and I always knew that I'd made the right choice. Um, as I said, I was in a sorority type club and um, when people got engaged, uh, they would pass the candle and that means they would call all the sisters together and we'd stand in a circle and this candle would go around the circle and eventually the person who was engaged would blow it out. So I blew it out. That's how I announced it. You probably wanted to know how we got engaged. Um, I, Alf and I went on a date. We came to Salt Lake and it was March and we went to, I, I don't, I don't remember the rest of this date, but we went to Liberty Park at night of all things, which I would not do now. And he gave me a Snoopy piggy bank and inside was the ring. So that's how we got engaged. Um, I, I think I knew it was coming. Well, I did because um, once Alf said, I think we should get married, I said, okay. And then the next day he told me that he had told his parents that we were getting engaged and I was shocked because I didn't think anybody should know yet. And, um, a week later, I had a ring on my finger, so he wasn't wasting any time just in case I changed my mind. <laughs> okay, um, we got married on July 16th, 1970, and we lived in Ogden. There was no Ogden Temple yet, so we got married in the Logan Temple, and um, I stayed at his parents' house the night of the wedding because we had to get up at about 5.30 to drive up to Logan. Um, his extended family, those that could attend the temple, were all there. And um, we both got our endowments that morning at about 9 o'clock. And then our wedding was supposed to be at 12 o'clock, but they were running late. And we were so excited to get married. I remember sitting on a bench in the hallway of the outside the ceiling rooms and just thinking, come on, come on, we want to get married. And um, finally, the ceremony took place. And um, I have to say it was in the temple, but I was not prepared for the temple. And um, it was probably not 
the experience it should have been, but it became, as, the, as we continued to go to the temple afterwards, I came to understand the importance of that and the beauty of having an eternal family and, um, and having children born under the new and everlasting covenant. And, um, but at the time, I don't think I understood. Afterwards, um, we went to Alf's backyard and his aunts and cousins and mother had uh, a nice luncheon for us. My grandmother, Nana, was there. My aunt, Marge, was there and both my sisters. Um, so I did have people there, but um, other than that little group and my parents, everyone else was from Alf's family. And then later that evening, we had a reception at Alf's um, ward house. And we had arranged for decorations and a photographer and everything. Um, and my sisters, I mean, we had, I had friends and, and bridesmaids and matron of honor with my sisters and my little niece Kathy and my nephew Mark were there so it was it was a special time with family but um, uh, like I said I don't think I realized the importance of our ceremony at the time uh, we went on a honeymoon to um, Jackson, Wyoming. We stayed at Signal Mountain in a little cabin that was $16 a night and um, that was that was really wonderful. And for years and years, we went back every other year, or at sometimes every year, back to um, Jackson and Yellowstone. It's a special place for us. It's it's really a beautiful place that we love to see every year. Um, and uh, I used, I think I had about. $230 saved and that paid for our honeymoon. <laughs> and that's all the money we had. We both worked at IRS for the next year as we finished our last year in college. Did you I did. Parents or did you have to pay it? My parents did not pay for a dime of school, books, tuition, nothing. I paid for all of it and um, I had saved some money um, because I was going to go to France with Bruce and his family that summer, but instead I married Alf. So the money I had saved for that paid for our wedding reception and our honeymoon. I turned 21 on our honeymoon and Alf was 21. So we were very young and had our first baby two years later. In 1971, we graduated from Weber State College and went down to work for Arthur Anderson in Southern California, we moved to Glendale, and we immediately bought a, an extra long double bed. What was wrong with us? We did not buy a queen mattress. We bought an extra long double bed uh, mattress. We bought a black and white television and a Bernina sewing machine, all within about a month, and those were our big purchases. And Alf bought a 1971 Camaro. <laughs> so that was just big. We were just, Alf was starting his career and boy, we went out and, and bought some big purchases. We thought we were rich. I think he was making 10,500. <laughs> uh, he is a very fun person. He has a tremendous amount of energy and uh, he's just very, very dynamic. I'm much more laid back and um, uh, not low energy, but I, I'm, I'm happy reading a book and he would rather be out riding his bike. So he's been a lot of fun. He was a lot of fun with his kids. Uh, he did like them to do the things that he likes, however, which is sailing and camping. And so we did a lot of that. He's just a very, he, he, he turned out to be a very awesome man. He has a tremendous amount of integrity. And in his work, um, uh, he works for a company now as he's trying to retire and they're buying him out where they want him to charge as much as possible. And his whole philosophy when he was uh, his own boss was to charge as little as possible. He was always about saving his clients money. So um, he's just full of integrity. He is 
willing to serve in his church callings, and he does it joyfully. Even today, um, as soon as we got home from state conference, he said, I'm going to go see so-and-so and so-and-so, and he named four people, and he took his dog on a walk and went and knocked on four do doors and talked to people that um, we haven't seen too much because of our calling. So he, he is just a dynamo. He never puts off till tomorrow what he can do right now, this minute. So um, he's been a, a wonderful, wonderful husband, um, very righteous, um, very worthy of the priesthood and an excellent father and grandfather and husband. Uh, we, we, would, we would hear people say marriage is something that you have to work at. And we just thought that was a terrible thing to say because it was so easy for us. And we thought it should come easy and it did. And maybe because we thought that. So um, we just we had a blast our first two years of marriage before kids. The first year when we were still in college, um, a date night would be going to Weber State and watching a movie for a dollar or going to um, A&W and getting a root beer ice cream cone for 25 cents um, or going hiking. Uh, we just, we made a lot of fun. Alf, Alf would, um, go catch a fish and we'd cook it on a little hibachi. We just, we had a lot of fun. The first year we were in California, we met several couples in our apartment building who also worked for Arthur Anderson and we became really good friends. And um, we all were having babies within a few months of each other. And so that first year of um, it, there, um, having, starting a career, I mean, we just, we thought, life was absolutely wonderful and it was and um, we had babies and and had this wonderful experience with our friends um, we who we are still close to to this day and so um, life was really good and our 20s were full of having babies and toddlers and it was really an absolutely wonderful life we enjoyed each other we enjoyed doing things together and we absolutely loved having our little kids. And um, I was new to the gospel, and so I was learning how to be an LDS woman and um, what it meant to serve in the ward. And, um, and we were involved with young women and young men and scouting, and it was, it was just a tremendous, tremendous life. Lori, uh, has been a chatterbox since she learned how to walk and talk. And um, she's been entertaining because of that. <laughs> she's still entertaining. Um, she can uh, be the center of attention and uh, not that she wants to be, but um, she has a lot to say and it's fun to be around her. Uh, when she was very young, two years old, she would sit in front of the TV and watch Sesame Street three times a day. And so she learned her letters very early. She knew all of her letters when she was two and a half. And one time when looking at her alphabet suit, soup, she saw um, the letter P and then she saw it again and she said, P, P, hey mommy, that spells tinkle. <laughs> um, she has always loved to learn. She likes to um, please people, and she also likes to please herself. An A wasn't enough. She wanted an A+. Plus. So she loved elementary school because they gave her huge assignments, um, big packets to finish, and she loved to do them up really big with artwork and, and everything imaginable. So, And she did get A-pluses at that stage of her life. Really, she got A's all of her life. Um, so she was a great student and a great um, teacher pleaser. Um, she has always been fearless. She is willing to try anything and do anything. And even if it sounds really difficult, she's sure she can do it. Um, she has overcommitted herself many times throughout her life. But um, somehow she pulls through it and she always has a good attitude and says, no, yeah, I, I was too busy, but it was okay. It was okay. It worked. And um, 
She's always willing to do anything that she's asked of. She has a strong testimony and um, is an excellent speaker and has a great way of bearing her testimony when she speaks and teaches. Of course, art has been a big part of her life since she was very tiny. We knew that she could draw when she was um, very young. When she was four, she drew uh, kind of like a stick figure of a giraffe, but it was in perfect proportion with the perfect length of neck and sloped back and tail and the right length of legs and spots that faded off into the line. And she just, she knew what she was doing very young. And so it's been a joy in my life to, to watch her art develop and to continue to watch her and listen to her teach and, um, and be the recipient of many um, pieces of art that I have hanging in my, my home. Um, she's just been a delightful child from day one. Um, Kelly, uh, our second daughter, uh, just a, a little over two years younger than Lori, she, um, she wanted to be like Lori, but she wanted to be different. And um, from the time she was very tiny and couldn't move yet, she'd sit and wring her hands as Lori walked from room to room because she wanted to follow her. But on the other hand, she wanted to be different and she wanted to find her, her own identity. And so eventually she did that. Um, she became a dancer and then a cheerleader. And um, it seems that at that time in her life, she finally um, was able to uh, see that she had wonderful talents and abilities of her own. And she has um, been that way ever since. Uh, she, uh, she also was a great student um, and a, a really good, righteous girl, as was Lori, and um, just made excellent choices. Um, she had the opportunity to date a lot and um, so when she met Rob when she was 19 and he was the one, we had no worries because we knew that she had dated a lot and sort of thrown everyone by the wayside until Rob came along and he was the one. She is a, a really wonderful mother and adult. Um, she is a wonderful neighbor. She helps people in need and never talks about it. You have to find out from someone else. She's very, very thoughtful and serving and giving, and especially to her family. She, um, she gives so much to her family and to her children's well-being uh, and has just been absolutely dedicated to their happiness. Um, and she's very good at, at mothering. Um, and I don't mean to say, I didn't mention that about Lori. She also is an excellent mother. I don't want to leave that out either. Um, Kelly also has a wonderful testimony and um, is also an, an excellent teacher and speaker and is able to express her feelings um, with passion and emotion. And um, she's very impressive. Um, Jimmy, uh, <laughs> Jimmy has been such a fun child to raise. He, um, he has always had to have friends. He was never able to stay home, didn't want to stay home. When he was three, he had neighborhood friends. And if one wasn't available, then he had to go find somebody else. So even in our neighborhood, he had many, many different friends and he would play with one for a couple of weeks and then he'd move on to another one and then he'd come back to the other one and then he'd find another one and so he's always had a lot of friends and even to this day he has many groups of friends the extremely social and um, very well liked person he is um, he has an uncanny ability to read people and uh, kind of morph into whatever situation he's in so that he is appropriate with any kind of people. And it's a real skill that he has, which has made him successful in the service industry, serving tables and guiding with people from all over the world and um, now as a salesman. So he, he is in the right field. He's been an excellent um, 
person to deal with other people and he's also entertaining when he talks about other people and the experiences he's had in the service industry. He is a great storyteller and can sit and, and entertain us for hours. Um, we always hoped that he would find someone to spend his life with and it took a while but he finally did and then unexpectedly had his first baby when he was 42, probably his first and last, but um, he is the father that we knew he would be. He adores his baby and Pam, and um, he is going to be a wonderful dad. It's very obvious. Um, Danny, uh, as a baby, it seemed that he wished he was a an only child. He uh, he guarded me from the other kids as if to say, my mom, not yours. And um, he was sort of that way until Jimmy got old enough to go to first grade and then Danny was an only child and all of a sudden he turned into a delightful, happy child after being kind of grumpy and ornery for three years. Um, he was my little buddy because he was at the tail end and so we went everywhere together until he was in school full time. and. Um, we've always had a great relationship. He was very gifted as a young child with language and math skills. Uh, when he was four, we used to entertain him during sacrament meeting by giving him addition problems. And um, he loved doing that. Uh, he was uh, playing t-ball when he was four or five and the coach said to us, well, He's not the best player, but he certainly is the one that has the game all figured out. And then he said, did you know he can do math? And we said, yeah, we know. <laughs> so um, we kind of steered Danny towards a career that would involve math skills. And he studied accounting and got a master's of accountancy from BYU and worked at it for about three years and really hated it. And uh, what he loves is what all of our kids love, and that is um, being involved with other people. They're all very social and well-liked and um, have great people skills. And um, so he and Mara, his wife, um, are um, sort of lifestyle coaches. They've approached it from different angles. and and probably have more sides to them yet to come, but um, uh, Danny has a real gift for uh, speaking, teaching, and writing. And um, he's also very, um, he has almost a, a thorough memory of everything he's ever heard or read. So he can recall anything, and, and that includes scriptures or something that he read or heard somewhere. And so um, he's sort of our spiritual leader when we need advice or um, a suggestion for something that we're studying. He uh, leads us right to what we need. He is, um, he is uh, I feel really close to Danny. And I feel really honored that sometimes he says we share the same brain. We don't really. Um, he's brilliant and I'm not, but um, we do tend to think alike. And so he's, he's been a delight. I am so proud of all of my children. Um, they turned into wonderful adult human beings and will continue to be. I, they are the pride and joy of my life. I feel so lucky that we get to live so close to um, Jimmy and Lori and Kelly's families and that we get to see them at least on Sunday, if not more. And um, so not only were they the joy of my life as I raised them, but they continue to be. They are my favorite people to be with. I would rather take a vacation with my children than anything else in the entire world. And, um, and they are raising really wonderful children that I also love with all my heart. So that's my kids, they're fabulous. Okay, I'd like to talk about um, how I came to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Um, when I grew up, we did not have a lot of religion in our house. I can remember um, 
because we moved every year, I kind of remember here and there where we went to church. I remember at one point in time, I think it was in Iowa City, so I was five or six. We went somewhat regularly, and I remember going to Sunday school um, with young kids like me and not being too impressed with it and feeling bored. And um, so I, I, I really, we didn't go often, and that was fine with me. Um, as I got older, I still wasn't particularly seeking for anything religious in my life. Um, it was sort of what you don't know, you don't miss. And then um, when we moved to Palmdale, California, I was in ninth grade, which was high school there. And I went to a football game the first week of school uh, with a friend that I had met, a girlfriend. And behind us, there were two boys who um, uh, started talking with us and then there was a dance afterwards and we all went to the dance together and um, we eventually became friends and then we had a very large group of friends through those two and so there were about nine boys and nine girls and we did a lot of group activities together. One of those boys happened to be an LDS convert. His whole family had joined the church and um, he had a friend named George who eventually also joined the church. And because of George, then I became interested and um, I uh, listened to the missionaries over at the church. Um, Steve, the original member that I talked about, his family would pick me up and take me to church. And then after church, I'd stay and have my lesson and then they'd bring me home. And um, they gave me a little pamphlet with Joseph Smith's history. And that was probably the most impressive thing um, that um, caused me to join the church. But I also had a great experience with prayer. The missionaries, uh, of course, asked me to pray to know if the church was right. And so I went home and laid on my bed and faced the ceiling, laid on my back and and said, um, God, if you're really there, is this right? And um, that sounds almost blasphemous to say if, but um, I had a, a really strong impression, um, very strong feeling come over me, almost like I was floating. And I knew that the Holy Ghost was talking to me. I might not have known it was the Holy Ghost at that point, but that's what it was. And so I continued with those lessons. And um, after six weeks, I decided to be baptized, and um, two and a half months later, we moved from Palmdale to um, Elko, Nevada, and um, at this point in my life, my sisters were both older and out of the house, so I was an only child, and when we moved, um, I didn't know how to get in touch with anyone at the church. So I just looked it up in the phone book and called someone. And the person, the number I called happened to be the bishop of the ward that I was in. And he told me when it was and when to go. And so I would walk to church on Sunday because my parents really, they didn't, um, they didn't prohibit me from joining. They they were fairly neutral. They weren't mad about it, but they also weren't supportive. So I was on my own. So I remember walking to church. It was only about six blocks and um, sitting by myself and eventually making friends and, and having a great experience there. But um, uh, I had that experience. And then... Um, about two years later, a little less than, I guess, a year and a half later, I was a senior in high school at this time. We moved to Ogden, Utah. And um, when I moved there, kids are so open. They're willing to say, are you a Mormon? And I would say, yes, but it's just a coincidence that I live in Utah um, because I've lived all over. And I really believed that for the longest time. And then finally, I started putting things together and realized that... Um, when I was 17 at the time, there was probably only one place in the world that I could move to where I would be dating LDS boys, be able to live at home and afford 
a college, which was Weber State College, that also had an Air Force base that my father could work at. And that place was in or around Ogden, Utah, and that is where the Lord took us when I was 17. And I'm ashamed to say it took me a long time before I realized that that was all orchestrated for my benefit so that I would be able to date boys as I got into college and date seriously and find someone to marry. And actually, I met Alf in the library at Weber State College, and the rest is history. Awesome. I didn't know you went to Boise State. Hmm. It wasn't that fun. It was hard. That was was like going to a it was like being in Ogden where everybody knew everybody. It you know, it was a local yeah. college, so it was tough. Cool. That was good. I don't know how good it was.